Let's, uh, let's move on to that set, set of notes then. Um, so the operability notes, the first slide looks something along these lines. So maybe let me introduce this topic of operability by asking you what this is. So to create these sort of devices, right? or not even qualify, but if we implement it exactly like that, will it, will it, it will illuminate, it will create some sort of light, but it's not going to be operable. Okay? Right now, if I follow that diagram literally, if I go and touch that switch, I'm going to electrocute myself. Right? So, and there's, there's no things on here that would make it nice to operate, like there's no dimmer want to increase or decrease the level of lighting. So there's things missing from it. It would be the equivalent of us doing up here what I have on the slide where we go and we go to Aspen or HiSys or we, even on pen and paper, it doesn't matter much how you do it, and you do a material and energy balance for a certain base case. So you want to produce a thousand tons per, per year of methanol, and you do the material and energy balance for that. And would you take that design and build it as it, right? So if you take this design up here on the board and build that circuit as is, there's a number of things about, the, about this that make it, it does its job, but it's unattractive. Okay, it's hard to maintain, and it doesn't work, and it's not quite as flexible as we'd like it to be. Same thing on the flow sheet that we're dealing with in this project. Right now, if we build it as is, that process actually wouldn't really work. Dr. Adams' flow sheet, all it's done for us is get material and energy balances, but it wouldn't operate and work as, as it is. Okay. We're going to start to look at how we make that process operable, and, and that's this topic of operability, is to see how we can make it more safe, how we can make it reliable, how we can handle variability coming in from, our, from around us. Okay, so this base case that we've always built in our courses. So in second year, third year, fourth year, you've always designed and done calculations for some nominal set of conditions. I'm going to try and convince you over the next two weeks that that's not good enough. So coming to a point in your engineering studies where we realize that this base case thing is a fiction, there's no such thing as steady state, there's no such thing as normal operation, and then in reality, abnormal is normal. So these are all things I'm going to try and convince you of over the next uh, few classes. So it would be the equivalent of us taking a car and trying to create a car and put on four wheels, an engine, and say there's your car. Right? You've got four wheels and an engine, yeah, it moves. But does it have the flexibility to achieve a wide range of operating conditions in a safe manner? Is it reliable? And will it have good performance? So four wheels and a motor doesn't guarantee it will work on icy roads or in rainy weather. It doesn't guarantee that it will be easy to maintain. Okay. Will it have good performance? Uh, will it be easy to operate? So power steering, automatic stick shift. Right? These are things that make it easier and nicer to use on a daily basis. We want the same thing for our chemical processes. If we take our chemical process and build it as is, it's definitely not going to be easy to operate. It's not going to have good performance that we need it to have. So these are some of the things that we're going to look at over the next few classes. And sometimes you'll see this term robust design. Okay, it, it, it kind of means the same thing. We're going to make our process robust to a variety of conditions. So let's take a look at, at, um, at an example. So we've seen a few of these before. Take a minute and 
write down in terms of simplicity which one is best, A versus B versus C versus D. Then rank it A versus B versus C versus D for cost, then for reliability. Okay, so just do the first three, simplicity, cost, reliability. So what's the purpose of all four of these? They all have the same objective, right? What is that objective? What do all four of these designs do? Easy question. Just material from the pump to the outlet. Move material from the pump to the outlet and with some form of regulation. Okay, so they all have that goal in mind. Now we've seen we've seen a, a few of these designs. So here we've got a, a, just a flow meter and a control valve, but they're not linked up. Okay. Here we've got the the standard sequence of four valves, and that's for maintainability. So I can take this valve in the middle out of service, replace it or maintain it in some way while still operating the process. So I've got the bypass that can be opened while these two are shut down, I can maintain that valve, have the bypass open, and still achieve operation. So that's great. Then there's this guy that's got no flow measurements. And then the last one is the same as, as option B, except we've got this additional control valve. What's that one here for, likely? Um, so during maintenance, if the other one's shut down, you can still control the flow. So we can still control the flow. That's one option. So during maintenance, we can still control the flow. It's also there for safety. Right? So during an SIS system, that might be your lock valve, and then it just totally stops the flow downstream. Even if this one was open and you're not bypassing, you would use this valve for safety reasons, for the same reason as I just showed you in the fire heater example. This valve may not seat 100% shut, so it might have some leakage. So if you need to totally shut this line, you use this upstream. So different levels of complexity there. So simplicity is easy to rank, and cost is likely inversely proportional to simplicity. Okay, so your ranking for cost and simplicity will likely be in inversely proportional to um, each other, or inverse of each other. When it comes to reliability, though, which option is more reliable? D. D. Then. B maybe, and then A and C together after that. Okay, so we can see that all four of these options achieve the same goal, but they do so in by different trade-offs in terms of simplicity, cost, reliability, and we'll see a few more other factors coming up that we need to consider. Okay. So coming back to this original slide, having someone say, I want to build a process, my base case is to move fluid, that's easy to do, and you can do that on a flow sheet very quickly, but how you actually implement it in practice afterwards is going to be substantially different and maybe a whole lot more costly than you originally thought. So originally you might think I just need a pump and a, and a valve. Well, by the end of this, if you really want a reliable system, you're going to need five valves, two control, two, two of them are control valves and a flow sheet, and some sort of control system around it. Okay, so your costs grow, grow substantially. So as you're all starting to see in this course, doing things in, in, in Aspen and, and pulling in your flow sheet is just the very first step. Um, there's a whole lot of additional costs beyond that that we need to consider. 
So let's, uh, uh, this is just the roadmap for this section. Um, what we'll look at is we'll quickly review today the process for designing a system, and then we'll look at some variability. Over the next few classes, then we'll consider eight topics around operability and go into detail on all of them. So here's the, here's the problem right, that we face. Build a methanol plant for a thousand tons per year. That's, that's the goal that you're given. Build a methanol plant for a thousand tons per year. So, okay, I can do this. I can go look and find, I need a gasifier. I need to do some water gas shift reaction. I need some absorber columns to pull out the H2S. I need some compressors there to sequester my CO2. I need a methanol synthesis loop and I'm done, right? So we select our process technology. So it's maybe not as quick and as straightforward as I just made it out to be, but it's fairly straightforward to set up for a given specification, we can go select the technology to do that. So that's the, those are the first two steps. And in, in that technology, I've also sequenced up, um, I kind of literally sequenced up those, those units in that order that I said there just now. Then you go to Aspen and you can simulate your flow sheet. You take your Aspen flow sheet and you design your equipment. So you design the size of your flash drums, your heat exchangers, your absorbers, your pack bed, and your compressors and so on. So we get the sizes of our units. Two, three years later, you've built all of that and you're starting up your process. And then you're like, oh shit, this thing doesn't work. <laughs> right? Because what you've assumed up there, three years from now, isn't the same thing. That feed material maybe isn't available. That biomass that you were going to use up here, you assumed maybe it had a certain carbon content, now is not available to you anymore. Okay. Or the coal that you were going to buy from Ohio doesn't have the specification that you used up here. Okay. So there's this inconsistency between what we're doing and what we've been taught to do versus what we need to do in reality. So in reality, we don't have one operating point. We don't just have one base case. We don't just have one feed flow rate. Okay, so maybe we're going to feed in coal at a certain tons per day. Now the economics have changed that we need to be really feeding in at double that to try and make our process economical because the, the world has changed between here at the beginning versus down here at the end. Or maybe we realize that the, the market for our product isn't quite as great as we thought it to be, so we don't operate at 100%, we operate at 75%. So we're still going to make money, but we can't go ahead and, and produce a hunt, run our post at 100%, we're just going to stockpile all this methanol and not be able to sell it. So let's scale back our operation. So we need to, to work at that lower flow rate. Also, if you go ahead and design my process, if you go design it for, say, temperatures during the summertime in Canada, it will, might not mean that you're able to operate your process in wintertime, or vice versa. If you design for wintertime conditions, you won't be able to operate in summer. So if you go or design your process for average conditions, it also means that half the year you won't be able to operate your process. Right? And so, you're starting to see where this is leading, is that there isn't one base case, there isn't a single operating point. There's an operating window, there always is an operating window at the ground process. So it's not one Aspen simulation, it's many Aspen simulations, with where this is going. So, so here's that procedure I, I outlined. We set our goals and our design specifications. We're going to modify that now. Instead of a single goal and a single base case, we need to present multiple goals and a range of conditions to operate. We may want to operate our process not only at a, at a thousand tons per year of methanol, but we also want to make sure that that process will work at 600 tons per year and 1,200 tons per year of methanol. So our process needs to be capable of operating over a range of conditions or a range of goals. Okay. What else might come in over here? So it's not just the range of the of the, the conditions. What else might we need to consider when we modify our base case? So 
not just throughput. I gave the example I gave was throughput. What else might change? <coughs> What about the economics? Like, uh, your product might sell for less or more, or there might be new regulations on, say, carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so we're talking on the design of the process. So that second one, the new regulations on carbon dioxide may have come in, or even they, even you built your process and two, three years from now, new regulations come in. Okay, so then we need to modify our process or change the operating point so we produce less. CO2, so we have less of a penalty. Yeah, just. Uh, equipment performance degrades over time. The equipment performance degrades over time. Can you give one or more examples of that? Uh, like, uh, I guess your pump impeller would be eroding. So the pump impeller might erode. Anyone else? Yeah, correct. Uh, distillation column trays will just disappear. They will curl right there. Distillation column trays disappear on us. Yep, that happens. Or they get fouled filled up with junk and the, the efficiency on that tray isn't quite what it was on the first day. Membrane fouling. Membrane fouling, if you've got a membrane process, yeah. That's why I said fouling on heat exchangers. Fouling on heat exchangers. Catalyst degradation. Catalyst degrading on us, okay. So all of these things are changing. That means we, we need to design our process for the worst of those conditions. So. In the meetings that I've had with a few of the groups, some of the common things that have come up is, let's recognize the process lifetime is 30 years. So in your economic analysis, you're going to have 30 periods. And every few years, you're going to shut down that process to do maintenance. So maybe every two years, you're going to shut down the process for a few days and do maintenance. On this last day in that two-year period, you want the process to still be capable of producing a thousand tons for the European. That means that though, even though the catalyst has decayed, even though your heat exchanger has fouled, even though your distillation column has lost one or more trays due to fouling or lack of efficiency or corrosion, that your process is still capable of working as good on the last day to meet your design. So this means that we end up over-designing our process. We use more trays than needed. We oversize our reactors so that there's more catalysts than we need, that our heat exchangers are larger than they would need to be otherwise, so that we can get this efficiency occurring on that, on that what we call end of run. So end of run, two years or three years, and some companies it's as short as one year, end of run, we're going to come in clean up process, we bring in a whole lot of contractors, shut the plant down, we go around cleaning, fixing up, and a few days later we start back up again. Obviously when we start back up, we're producing at amazing throughput and really great efficiencies because everything's pretty much like it was back when the first day we built. But then as time progresses near the end, then you're slowly degrading your, your performance. Okay, so we need to take that into account over there. So accept less than full production rates and less than top efficiency for, for extreme situations. So our design goal is not for that base case. Our design goal is actually for worst case operation. We also need to consider that our process technology can have an impact on our design decisions. So for example, selecting a fluidized bed might mean uh, we have a smaller range of flow than a packed bed column. So fluidized beds have very, very narrow ranges of flow. A pack bed, we can have a greater range of flow through that pack bed. If a large variability in flow is something that's important to us, so I want to be able to operate at low flow and high flow, I need to consider this quite carefully. Okay. Some of your decisions might be, well, have a fluidized bed and then in parallel have a pack bed. So have your pack bed take on the slack and your fluidized bed always operate at some constant so now we're going to start to see a lot of this, the time in this course, series of parallel configurations coming up. It's going to be very common. Anyone walked around a plant and noticed a series of parallel configurations? All the time, right? You walk through a chemical plant, you'll see, you won't just see one pump, you'll see three pumps. Come in, feed splits, and it goes out to three pumps. 
always done for economic efficiency and for, maintain, for maintenance and reliability. So very, very common features that we'll see. So next time you do, if you, any of you haven't done the boiler house tour or you walk through a plant in the future, pay attention to what you see around you. You'll always see this redundancies and parallel circuits that we set up for that reason. Okay. Some other things that will, will impact us are we like to have recycle, so we, we retain our energy. So we recover a lot of energy through recycle. We do this from a sustainability perspective as well as, as reducing the costs of the process. But recognize then that a recycle loop is actually going to constrain us, right? A recycle stream can, can, while it will give us a wider range of operation, a recycle loop is really hard to start up. Because a recycle loop by its nature, we, we've kind of always simulated that steady state. And here's a recycle loop and it's operating regularly, but we've never thought of how we get to start up that recycle loop when there isn't a recycle. Okay. So things change and we need to then, there's going to be an additional cost to get that recycle loop in place. So once we've made some of those decisions, then we go ahead and we'll simulate. Um, we'll simulate with different efficiencies, with different feed flow rates, and we'll figure out what this process is actually capable. We'll talk a bit about that in the next class. And we're going to see at the end of this, the, at the very least, the, the message you're going to take away from this is that the base case is not going to be good enough. So designing for the base case operation is not going to get it and solve up our, our uh, not going to meet our conditions. So what we will do is we'll, we'll go through this process. We'll select our technology, our process sequencing. We'll simulate the flow sheet. We'll size our equipment, and we'll consider operability. If anything here is fails, then we're going to make some changes, come back through the cycle, and we'll, we'll need to go through this loop a few times until you get a design that meets all the specifications up here and is operable. Okay, so we're going to see that over the next few classes, um, starting next week. So enjoy your break. We'll see you back on Tuesday.